Hello everyone, hope you're having an awesome day. Happy Halloween Eve. Thanks for joining me here on CNN 10, your news where I simply tell you the what, letting you decide what to think. Today it's your CNN 10 because some of you helped us write today's show by submitting your vocabulary word for Your Word Wednesday. Let's get started. The former Soviet Union launched the first human into space in 1961 with Yuri Gagarin's historic orbit. Not long after, NASA's historic Apollo 11 mission put humans on the moon in 1969. Now that space race between global superpowers, which lasted for years, kicked off humanity's journey to the stars. But now, Private companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin have joined national space agencies in launching both crewed and uncrewed missions to the stars. We are entering a new era of space exploration that includes plans for returning to the moon, establishing bases on Mars, and pushing the boundaries of human achievement beyond Earth's atmosphere, with some hoping that one day humans could live in outer space. This past September, the Polaris Dawn mission made history by reaching the highest Earth orbit in almost 60 years. But here's what's really cool. The crew wasn't made up of traditional astronauts. These were civilian space explorers, and they even performed the first all-civilian spacewalk. And while they were up there, we hit a new record, 19 people in space at the same time. Now that may not sound like a lot, but three years ago, that record was only 14. So that's quite the population boom for space. But living in space can impact your health. Did you know the heights of astronauts can increase approximately 3% over the first three to four days in space? And about 60% of space travelers deal with something called space motion sickness. So why are scientists so focused on figuring out what happens to our health in space? Well, with increased travel to outer space and the hope that one day our population could live in zip codes outside of Earth's surface, the science of what happens to our bodies is important. CNN's Dr. Sanjay Gupta has more. And the liftoff of the Polaris Dawn mission on the Falcon 9 rocket. In September, the four crew members of the Polaris Dawn mission made history. Welcome to orbit. By going to the highest levels of orbit in nearly 60 years and performing the first all civilian spacewalk. Commander Jared Isaacman now emerging. Jared, is commercial space travel a looming reality for most people? I certainly think so. A great proof point is while we were in orbit, there were 19 people uh, in orbit at once, which was a record. Mm. Uh, and three years ago, when I went to space for the first time, the record was 14. Now, these, are, these may seem like uh, small numbers, but they're steps in the right direction. But to keep moving in the right direction, there is still so much to overcome. About 60% of people flying to space are afflicted by space motion sickness. This really hits you for the first few days. Anna Menon was the mission's medical officer. Can you give us some, some details? What, what did you experience? There are all, it can be a whole spectrum of experience from, you know, lightheadedness, nausea, all the way to vomiting. I experienced really the whole gamut. It's because of the lack of gravity that messaging to our brains can go awry, and that can result in motion sickness like side effects. But you should also know that the brain physically changes during space travel. Look here. It shifts up ever so slightly in the skull, and the fluids surrounding and protecting the brain expand. It's a very austere environment. We're all going to be uh, susceptible to something. Uh, for me, it was it was kind of this mild uh, uh, headache that I had to deal with that was perpetual for, for a majority of the mission. Scott Poteet was the mission's pilot. What he noticed were changes in his vision. More or less, my vision acuity started to deteriorate uh, those first few days, but immediately came back once I uh, came back to Earth. 50 to 70 percent of astronauts, after spending periods of time on the International Space Station, have degradation in their vision. Dr. Donna Roberts has spent more than 20 years with NASA trying to understand why symptoms like that occur. We've been analyzing MRI brain scans of astronauts that were obtained before they went into space and then sometime after they landed back on Earth. What you're seeing is an exclusive look at the post-flight health data collection the Polaris team underwent, testing everything from their balance and their vision, as well as the imaging of their brains. 
one of the unique aspects of this mission is the astronauts went deeper into space than astronauts had been since the Apollo days and, and more exposure to radiation. And so the question could have been, was there any evidence of radiation injury? And we're not seeing that on the initial look at these images. So that's a really good thing. Do you think we're getting to the point where humans could reliably live on space station or even a different planet? There's so much that changes when you're actually in microgravity. That's not how we evolved. But I think that really just underscores the importance to me of the research we are doing, the data we're collecting that can then feed into how do we solve some of these challenges? How do we enable so many more people to get to space? It's that sort of research and data that might lead to another giant leap for mankind. 10 second trivia. According to current research, what animal has organs that are the closest anatomically to humans? Monkey, pig, dog, or bear? If you said pig organs, you are correct. They are roughly the same size as human organs, making them the most suitable for transplantation. What if animals could talk? And I mean talk to you and you understand them. Well, some researchers using artificial intelligence have made a breakthrough with pigs that could revolutionize how we understand animals. While we might think oinks and squeals are just random barnyard noises, we're learning that maybe these pretty poor sign creatures are trying to tell us something. Does this indicate happiness, discomfort, or stress? With the help of AI, European scientists developed an algorithm that may just be capable of decoding pigs' noises, as well as keeping farmers updated on their pigs' well-being. To develop the AI algorithm, scientists collected thousands of recordings of pig sounds in various scenarios, including play, isolation and competition for food. Once collected, they were placed in a database. We had this huge database of calls um, that are producing specific emotions, specific contexts by many different peaks and kinds of peaks. Scientists found short grunts typically signal positive emotions. Long grunts often indicate discomfort. Screams or squeals could show stress. We developed uh, AI, so in, uh, artificial intelligence that could tell us um, be trained to tell us if the, the, the calls that we recorded were um, emotionally positive or negative. The study of animal emotions is a relatively new field. It highlights the importance of livestock's mental health to their overall well-being. Most welfare strategies today focus only on the animal's physical health. And now with the explosions of AI methods, it actually becomes more and more easy to do these things. Scientists hope this tool will be developed into an app for farmers' phones, helping to translate what pigs are saying in terms of their emotions. Today's story getting a 10 out of 10. Pumpkins that float, not in space, not in the air. We're talking on water with people in them. We're picking up our paddles and Gordon to Belgium, where hundreds of people are taking their life jackets and jack-o'-lanterns on an infractuous journey in an annual pumpkin regatta. These are no ordinary boats. They are in fact giant hollowed out pumpkins. The annual pumpkin regatta in Belgium drew over 300 participants this year, according to Reuters. Regels zijn eigenlijk redelijk eenvoudig. Er zijn teams van vier mensen die gaan naar een pompoen varen, die varen een rondje, die gaan de volgende ophalen, de volgende vaart weer een rondje en het gaat simpelweg om de snelste tijd. The race began in 2008 as a creative way for local growers to make use of their oversized fruits. After the race, the pumpkins are turned into fertilizer for future crops and the seeds are stored for next year. All right, I want to give a big congrats to at Maddie Petrie on Instagram for submitting our winning vocab word today, infractuous, an adjective meaning full of windings and intricate turnings. Thank you for making us smarter today. I also have to give our shout out of the day, and this one's going up to all of our friends at T Area High School in T South Dakota. Rise up. We see you. Thank you for submitting your shout out requests on our CNN 10 YouTube channel. Let's do it again tomorrow, shall we? We'll see you right back here on CNN 10.